that says that Iran unintentionally shot down a passenger plane over Tehran with surface-to-air missiles. Senior Trevor Kleichen just reported that the Iranians are clearing the debris field. Joining us now, CNN anchor Richard Quest, who covers aviation for us. Richard, the debris field itself, I know you think this is a key area of evidence. Why is it so important? And what does it tell you if the Iranians are clearing it? It is shocking that this field is being cleared in some indiscriminate way less than 48 hours after the incident and way before any international investigators, the NTSB or TSB from Canada, have been allowed to get there and see it. I agree with that. That debris field, John, is the evidence field. Right. That's the field that's going to tell you what happened. Right. Those pieces of wreckage need to be poured over by highly qualified forensic exactly. engineers and scientists who will be able to extrapolate from the tears and the moves and the, uh, and, and what, the way they look. Let me read you one line from MH17. Remember the plane that crashed, that was brought down over Ukraine. That investigation says the exterior side of the fuselage showed evidence of perforation from the outside. So that, that small example shows you every piece of metal, the, the, the clothing that the passengers are wearing, they will all have individual stories to tell that collectively will build a picture of what happened and to just clear the field, put the debris and wreckage into a hangar, it, it, it's, it's breathtaking. So, Richard, if investigators can't see the debris field intact because of what the Iranians are doing, will they be able to um, definitively figure out what happened here, particularly from that video that we've all seen? That I think it speaks volumes of the fact that they don't want international professional investigators coming in there and looking at things because the proof is in the pudding of them being guilty toward shooting the plane down. In other words, this is their way of covering up the crime. They shot down a civilian plane. They killed about 176 people. You can see the video where the plane got hit. The explosion happened. You can see the the missile that was that was approaching the plane. The missile was made out of Russia that hit the plane. This is the reason why war has never been a pleasant, glorious, glamorous thing. Because there's always innocent lives that wind up being desecrated in the proceedings of a major calamity. I don't know if it was done intentionally or unintentionally, but the fact of the matter is, it was done. And it was done within the first few minutes of whenever everybody was on such high alert. In a way, I can kind of see their, their, um, their, their sight or their side of wanting to know how come anybody in that area would would have been flying a passenger plane to have begun with in that particular uh, area that was under such high alert. But maybe everybody didn't know that everybody was in a high alert. You know, whenever you have communication barriers that's going on in the United States pertaining to the Internet and what's going on with various people, actors, bad actors, towards trying to uh, breach or hack into various various uh, entities over here in America, unbeknownst to the people until after it happens, it's all wrapped around 
the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. You know, I've heard him argue that on the on TV as far as, my God, why in the world would that plane have ever been taken off to begin with? Well, maybe that plane and maybe the people on that plane didn't know what was fixing to happen. Or vice versa. Maybe they did know what was fixing to happen and they was fixing to exit the area because they felt like that their survival rate would have been higher towards getting the heck out of there versus hanging around in that area. I don't know. I don't know which it was. Maybe they either didn't know or maybe they did know. But the fact of the matter is it was the Iranians that killed a hundred and something lives out of the sky. That's what we have to look forward to on a all out and out assault, on a all out and out war of collateral damage that occurs during a major event like this. It is so sad to watch it unravel on TV. Please watch it. It is so sad. Please, to my viewers, watch what you're seeing because it can actually be emotional. Looks very damning. It is damning. The video will only take you so far. The video has no corroborative evidence to go with it. The video can have been doctored, invented, whatever you want to say. The thing you need to do is get your hands on the wreckage and get your hands on the evidence. Because there you, as I, I, I quoted, there you will see evidence of missile debris shrapnel that would have been inside. It's distasteful to discuss these things at breakfast, I realize, uh, John and Alison, but, but one thing they discovered with MH17 was that the remains, the human remains, had evidence of the shrapnel that was in the missile, the way it was designed to explode. And it was a similar missile that we're talking about in this case. So you are going to want to have the world's top experts looking at that wreckage. Now, as I, I said before that there is a very easy way, of course, that we can establish this, and that's Iran can admit what it may have done. But since they are flatly denying it, flatly denying it, for the rest of the aviation community and the that credible, that credible report that the Canadian Prime Minister insisted upon, the only way is to have their accredited representatives examine the wreckage and remains. Really helpful, Richard. Thank you very much for all of your expertise in this. That that certainly paints an important picture for us. So, back here last night, President Trump offered a new explanation for why he ordered the killing of Iran's top general. Are his claims true? That's next. Stay tuned for a special TV offer and learn how to get free shipping. Grilling is ruined in the rain. Food burns and falls apart. Indoor. It is so sad whenever people on the planet cannot even agree <coughs> towards who the bad guy is versus who the good guy is. What has happened to us? Seems to be, to me, completely contradicting from your man in Washington. It's all food for thought. When what has happened to us as people on a planet that's supposed to be able to make good rational decisions? Facing a monumental day in our politics. The Lead with Jake Tapper, today on CNN. We live in such a fast-paced world. Maybe that's it. It happened. Maybe that's the answer. We live in such of a fast-paced world, we don't take enough time to sit down and reason things out for ourselves in identifying the difference between good and bad, right and wrong. Maybe that's the answer. One hour. Live in too, too fast of a pace of a world. While we're steadily heading towards a major calamity. 
President Trump lashing out at a rally in Ohio last night after the House voted largely along party lines, but not completely, to stop him from taking further military action against Iran without approval from Congress. The Senate could take up a similar measure as early as next week. CNN's Athena Jones is live on Capitol Hill. Athena, what do we need to know? Good morning, Allison. Well, in a whirlwind week and just a day after President Trump signaled tensions with Iran are de-escalating, the House passed a war powers resolution. Now, the move is largely symbolic, but how the House Democratic leadership says it was necessary. The current resolution is adopted. The House sending a strong message to President Trump, approving a war powers resolution to limit future military action against Iran without congressional approval. This bill was just something to remind everybody that we should be debating things like war and peace. Some lawmakers from both sides of the aisle crossing party lines on their vote. Three Republicans voting yes including Congressman Matt Gates, one of President Trump's strongest allies in the House. It did not say he was wrong in killing Soleimani. It did say that if any president wants to drag our nation into another forever Middle East war, that they require the approval of the United States Congress. That's something I deeply believe. Multiple people who have spoken with President Trump say he's furious over Thursday's vote. The president defended his decision to kill Iran's top military leader at a rally last night. They're all trying to say, how dare you take him out that way? You should get permission from Congress. These are split-second decisions. You have to make a decision. Trump going directly after top Democrats, arguing they can't be trusted. We didn't have time to call up Nancy, who is not operating with a full deck. Now they want us to call, can you imagine calling crooked Adam Schiff? He's so crooked. He's so crooked. Shifty Schiff. They want us to tell them so that they can leak it to their friends in the corrupt media. House Democrats choosing a resolution that will never be presented to the president for his signature. This is a statement of the Congress of the United States, and I will not have that statement be diminished by whether the president will veto it or not. Meanwhile, Senate Democrats are also pushing to pass similar legislation, which a senior White House official tells CNN the president vows to veto. Democrats already gaining support from at least two Republican senators frustrated by the Trump administration's handling of the situation. The core issue here is making sure that before President Trump takes us into a war with Iran, that he recognizes he must come to Congress to get authorization. Now, there's disagreement between the parties about whether the House resolution is legally binding. And in any case, the resolution faces a... Notice their wording have changed towards taking us into war versus preventing us from a war. Have, has anybody taken time to notice that? That now they're changing their wording and all of a sudden it's Trump taking us into a war versus trying to prevent a war. Have you noticed that? Uh-huh. The sly of the hand. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I tell you, whenever you're dealing with an onslaught of ignorance, this onslaught of ignorance is the very thing that helped to cause the death of over 3,000 civilians here in America whenever a bunch of Arabs decided that they was going to take four planes and turn them into missiles and kill as many people as they did during 9-11. We are dealing with the same type of ignorance of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing even right up underneath our very noses. This is what makes it dangerous over here in America because they are so divided, so separated. This is what is causing the piece of machinery to work ineffectively here in the free, open, fair world called the world of democracy over here.
much tougher test in the Republican-controlled Senate. Meanwhile, a new poll, poll by USA Today shows 55% of people believe that killing General Soleimani has made the U.S. less safe, compared with 24% of people who believe it's made us more safe. See, I don't agree with that statement. Because putting a Band-Aid on a problem, kicking the can down the road, is exactly what the Americans have been notorious towards doing now for the past 25, 30 plus years. It was only Ronald Reagan who had the courage and the insight towards looking at evil and calling evil evil by telling Gorbachev to tear down that wall. He didn't try to pass it down to the next administration. He didn't try to paint it up like it was not something that it wasn't. He was a straight shooter and he called it what it was. A evil democracy or an evil uh, you wouldn't call it a democracy, an evil um, way to be to to treat your people as far as communist control. Today, we try to debate everything, whitewash everything, smoke screen everything. Today, rather than approach a situation head-on similar to our national debt we think the answer is by avoiding certain things in life you can't avoid reality towards the degree of what reality is showing its ugly head towards pertaining to these monsters. And there's a whole lot more of them over there, trust me. Other than this general that the President of the United States gave a green light towards taking him out. Those are interesting numbers, Athena. Thank you very much for that reporting. Joining us now, we have CNN political commentator and former Republican Congressman Charlie Dent and CNN political analyst Margaret Taleb. She's the politics and White House editor for Axios. Great to have both of you. Margaret, is it notable that eight Democrats abandoned their party to not vote for this resolution and that three Republicans voted with Democrats? Yeah, they're both interesting, Allison, for different reasons. I mean, I think with these Democrats, uh, largely you're seeing these are lawmakers in uh, more conservative districts with uh, potentially tight reelection contests. Also, for some of them, uh, they may actually believe this is not the right way to try to constrain a president's authority. In the Republicans' case, like, I don't think you get a much stronger, uh, more loyal ally than Matt Gates if you're the president, but even so, he's in a district uh, with more military members than any other House member uh, in the country. And it's important for him to send his messaging to his constituents that he's most concerned that uh, they're protected and that war resolutions, uh, war actions happen in the right way. So you saw some of these interesting cross currents. But at the end of the day, what you really have is um, the Congress's sort of ability to rebuke here even if it doesn't have the force of law, and this isn't going to have the force of law, even if the Senate were to take the same action. This is a political signal. This is a message to the president. It's a message to the American public. But ultimately, the commander in chief in the American system has a lot of authority uh, to make foreign policy decisions, including military ones. Right, and he can veto the bill if it ever does get to his desk, as he almost certainly will. But that doesn't mean it's not an important discussion. It's a foundational discussion, Charlie, as you note, about how this country is supposed to operate during war. Uh, and it's a discussion that should be sober and honest and not filled with the kind of invective that we've seen. I want to play the sound from Doug Collins, congressman from Georgia from a few days ago, that I think has outraged so many people. Listen to this. 
Nancy Pelosi does it again, and her Democrats fall right in line. One, they're in love with terrorists. We see that. They, they mourn Soleimani more than they mourn our Gold Star families who are the ones who suffered under right. Soleimani. That's a problem. Now, Tammy Duckworth, the Democrat who supports this War Powers Resolution, says, I left literal parts of my body in Iraq where I was fighting terrorists, and then goes on. So, Charlie, again, you could oppose this measure. You could think the president has large powers as commander-in-chief. But you don't need to go where Doug Collins went. Yeah, John, I would I would agree with that. I think everybody's got to take a step back from this inflammatory rhetoric. Look, I felt that this resolution was as much a debate about the president's volatile style uh, than it was about the delicate balance between the legislative and executive branch in terms of the ability to, to make war. Congress, if they really want to amend this War Powers Act, they should change the law. And I think they need to have that kind of a sober discussion. We had this discussion, you may remember, uh, when Obama took out, uh, justifiably, Anwar al an American citizen in Yemen. Uh, I supported Obama at that time. We had a big debate about whether or not you should be able to kill an American citizen. Uh, and I think President Trump was justified to take out Soleimani. But uh, we should have a real debate about the War Powers Act. I don't think doing a, a joint or concurrent resolution is the, is the best way to do this change the law. But I but this is hard because this is a this is a tough question about the, the actual limits of the ability of the president to wage war. He he has some authority for a limited duration of time under the current War Powers Act. Um obviously once more they have changed the wording of waging war towards what it originally was on preventing war. Why are they doing this? There is such of a strategy towards cutting off something before it gets bad. That's the whole primary purpose for investigators and people over here in America towards finding out that, that some sort of a, a homegrown terrorist attack is fixing to take place and the authorities move on it towards spoiling their actions. If the authorities didn't have the authority to do that, could you only imagine how many more innocent lives would be destroyed, such as what had occurred out in Las Vegas? If somebody would have known that an idiot was stockpiling guns and bullets and put all the dots together towards this individual, they could have possibly stopped him from kicking out a window up in a high-rise and unloading, ain't no telling how many artillery rounds, on a group of people in the center of a concert, killing over 60 and injuring, I think, over, what was it, 300 or 3,000 or something like that? If somebody would have known, they could have stopped it. How are you going to be able to stop something like that if you're going to have to go and debate it with the House of Representatives that don't know their ass from a hole in the ground to begin with? There's been many, many situations here in America to where if the authorities didn't go ahead in and try to spoil whatever had been talked about online or whatever they found out about that was going to occur, there's been many occurrences to where if it wasn't for the authorities, there ain't no telling what type of innocent bloodshed that we would have already done seen over here in America pertaining to homegrown terrorism. We're going to have to wake up, and we're going to have to do the right thing. As harsh and as, cr and as uh, uh, hardcore as it may sound, we're going to have to do the right thing if we're going to survive and if our children are going to survive towards a future into tomorrow. Because it's pretty obvious that good is under attack by evil. And it's not just in necessarily a anti-Semitism religion type form. 
It's got to do with the wickedness of of a entity that is trying to dominate the good entity. And in this entity that's trying to take over the good entity, if they can completely uh, get us entrenched to the point that we don't have no renewability room towards being able to move around and do the right thing to prevent loss of life, the next thing you know, it'll turn into just a total madhouse. And that's exactly what Satan wants it to turn into. You got to be able to look into this, into its deeper motive of why these occurrences continue to keep happening to begin with. And it's not just here in America. It's happening all over the world pertaining to these terrorist plots that are that are escalating all over America towards towards trying to bring harm and hurt to innocent people's lives. What's the old saying? That offense a lot of times is as good or better than defense? It's just like playing a, a, a football game. You know, if you're going to be the initiative out there towards going up against all this harm and gruesome activity that's, that's occurring with, uh, with evil, you're going to have to wake up to its tactics and you're going to have to work smarter instead of harder. That way you can get ahead of the program towards being able to defeat this onslaught that has brought so much misery and cruelty to innocent, innocent lives up onto this planet. And getting up at the White House and debating about various policies and various laws just shows you where we are as a society. Now granted, I don't think any president should be able to order an assassination upon any person for any reason. I think it has to be a valid reason of the reason why that he done what he done in the way that he done it. But as long as it can be validated, as long as it can be proven, as long as there's something to it, then instead of the President of the United States being looked down upon, he should actually be commended because that's exactly the reason why that we even have a president is so that he can be on his toes towards seeing stuff that the ordinary person down here on the ground can't see because he's engaged in affairs that people like us aren't. That's the whole purpose for being the president is so that you can possibly uh, head off this type of, of tyranny that is going to fall up onto society in an evil, demonic, cruel way that's going to bring that much more pain and suffering to not only the American people, but to other people throughout the world. We're still trying to figure out exactly what happened with that plane where 176 passengers were killed. Um, Iran has a different explanation at the moment than Canada, the U.S. Oh, Ron's in denial. And any country would be in denial. You got to look at the facts. They're denying it. They're wanting to cover it up. UK. But you're already, Margaret, hearing lawmakers, um, well, I mean, casting blame for how, why this happened. So listen to this moment. This is yet another example of collateral damage from the actions that have been taken in a provocative way by the President of the United States. Blaming the President for the Iranian airliner shoot down. We are broken as a country if this is the level of our debate going forward. I mean, it... It's sickening. It's demoralizing. It's shameful. It's appalling. All the, all the words above. All the words above to even remotely come close in saying that it's our fault. That is how twisted 
that a lot of people up there in the White House are. They cannot call black, black, and white, white. They are no longer straight shooters. And I don't know if we've all become a bunch of educational fools to the point that we've become too educated. But whenever it comes to right and wrong, you have to identify that if somebody such as this general over there, this Iranian general was, was that demonic and that wicked and demented and, and evil, he should have been taken out years and years ago. It's time, folks, that we quit kicking the can down the road. We cannot take every issue and put it into a corner and announce, well, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, so it's taken care of. No, it ain't taken care of. No, it ain't taken care of. It's lurking. It's waiting in the dark. To merge again. That's kind of like treating a disease in, in your body. <clears throat> you know, whenever you treat cancer, you just don't treat one part of cancer. You just don't treat cancer that's in one leg. You just don't treat cancer that's in one finger. When you treat cancer, you treat all the cancer. And you try to snuff out that cancer. And even at trying to do it in the appropriate way, you still may have a certain, a certain cell that is hiding within the body somewhere that you just didn't discover. You didn't see it. You thought you was cancer free. And then four or five years later, that same cell that you thought was dormant has now reappeared and it has taken the body back over and the next thing you know the second surge or onslaught of cancer will be worse than the first you can use that analogy the same way towards ridding or stomping out the very axes of evil evil that's lurking in the dark not just over in Iran not just over in the Middle East but evil that is lurking right here as the Walmart slogan coming near a neighborhood near you and until the American people and until the Christian society people wake up to what is happening it's only going to intensify and grow even worse. Both make interesting points, but I also think that it's fair to say this would not have happened if there were not tensions between the U.S. and Iran. Well, guess what? We are broken as a country. That's what we're all talking about right now. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's actually really uncomfortable to watch how uh, quickly and highly uh, this tragedy has been politicized on uh, both sides of the partisan fence and now Justin Trudeau's comments are being uh, picked apart for well, why isn't he defending the U.S.? What, what, well, you know, what's the implications of what he's not saying? Like, uh, this happened and it's a tragedy and it's connected. It's all part of it. And uh, as investigators are struggling to find out what really happened. Uh what happened was Iran shot down a passenger plane that caused the death of 176 people. That's what occurred. They shot it down with a missile. That's what happened. Uh, I think a lot of U.S. officials are kind of surprised that it didn't f mm -hmm. inflame matters more, the fact that the U.S. and Iran uh, both uh, have been able to sort of step back quickly. The political rhetoric continues to heat up, uh, but at least um, in terms of on the ground and in terms of the country's behaviors, this was a potentially much more disruptive tragedy in terms of its spillover implications. You know, one thing I do want to say is Adam Kinzinger also said that Doug Collins should apologize for his comments and was also critical of Jackie Speer for suggesting the U.S. was somehow to blame for the collateral damage of this Iranian jetliner being shot down. Kinzinger's point, Charlie, is that if the, if the Iranians shot the missiles, they shot the missiles. 
Yeah, look, I think exactly. that's absolutely right. He was exactly. He was you know, he had the right to criticize both lawmakers for making, I thought, uh, rhetorically ex excessive statements. I don't think it's right to blame the United States uh, for the, the Iranian, uh, for probably an unintentional taking down of that, that jetliner. Uh, but I think Ken Zinger's right. And I, again, we're, we're back. It, it's sad that it, in this country we need to have this debate on the War Powers Act. And again, you know, it's kind of it's become so, uh, so horribly partisan. I can tell you, having served in the House, there were plenty of Republicans, thoughtful Republicans, who wanted to, to look at these authorizations to use military force, and they think they have been taken too far. But you can't have this debate in this kind of supercharged partisan atmosphere, which is really the tragedy. Congressman Charlie Dent, Margaret Talib, thank you both very much. Thank you. you can have it. You can have this debate, and you can point fingers this way, but it's awful foolish. Like I said, whenever you go to changing the wording of preventing a war towards escalating into a war, now the whole dynamics has changed. Now we got a warmonger such as Trump, according to some people's analogies, some people's thought pattern. Now we have a president that is trying to start a war rather than prevent a war. Who would do this? What group of people would attack their own leader this way in trying to say that his motives was evil versus good? I'm going to tell you what group of people would do this. A group of people that is mixed up. A group of people that don't know their ass from a hole in the ground. A group of people that don't know the difference between right and wrong. It is sad. It's very sad whenever something like this occurs under the pretense towards the defense of innocent men, women, and children. And you want to call good bad and bad good. It is so, the state that we're, we are in right now as Americans is one of the most dangerous of states that we have ever been in in our entire lives. At least the people during the World War II era identified real, real quick, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, at least they identified that we was under attack whenever Pearl Harbor got hit. And there wasn't no ifs, ands, buts about it. They immediately started locking up people that was of the same entity that done the, the, the attack. Because they realized that America was under attack. Did we do that here in America whenever over 3,000 people died? No, we did not. And that was one of the first things that should have occurred on the same level that occurred during the attack of Pearl Harbor. You see the difference in the cultures between that culture in the 40s versus the culture during 9-11, their response was different. Their actions was different. The way they attacked the problem was different. We're in trouble. We are in deadly serious trouble here in America towards us having the original practices that our forefathers and our builders had in protecting this great nation, the nation of America, towards innocent men, women, and children's lives. We are in trouble as a whole looking at it in that perspective. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking time and trying to analyze and decipher this particular problem. Good luck to all of us.